Have you ever felt just closed in from every side and you're just surrounded and overwhelmed and, and fearful for your life, fearful for even living out your life. You're just frightened and smothered and overwhelmed. Much like this young skier must have felt in Portugal, Around him is a wave that they measured 125 feet high. He is skiing under that wave. You see him there in the street. And if it would crash in on him, would he have a chance to live, survive, or would he be crippled the rest of his life? Ladies and gentlemen, my brothers and sisters, right now, today, this moment in time and history, so many of us in America present in this worship service, if we sit down and get quiet and get honest, we feel a lot like that skier. Because everything we thought were foundational, permanent, this is who we are, is being ripped away in ways we never could have imagined. I ran into this week some new initials. Initials that I'd never heard of before. ESG. Some of you are familiar with those initials. It is a picture of what's happened around the world, and it's a picture of wokeism marrying the free enterprise system. Isn't that amazing? Wokeism is the very opposite of everything we know as far as business is concerned. It's the opposite of it. It is anti-business, but yet wokeism has married capitalism, and it was an arranged marriage because the wokes are trying to use the capitalists, and the capitalists are trying to use the woke, and the symbol for this is E, environment, S, social, G, for governance. Stay with me, I won't bore you. What has happened is, thanks to Klaus Schwab, who I would nominate as the most probable antichrist in our day and age. Every day and age have had an antichrist, but he would be way at the top of my list. He is a part of this. It started about in 24 and a retired Secretary General of the United Nations decided he would meet with the top 50 wealthy, prestigious CEOs, market managers, et cetera. And when they met, he had came up with the idea if somehow we could take all the corporate, the moneyed society of the world and marry it with the woke agenda. The E is for environment. You have to buy into all the super craziness of the Al Gores and the rest of that crew. You have to buy into that. Then the S part is the socialism part, which means we buy into that woke part, the CRT, the transgenderism and all of that, that's a part that has to be included. Then finally, the last G is governance, in which a company or organization has to be all of these things and their governance must be on the basis of diversity and equity, etc. And therefore, if you are, have this stamp on your business or your corporation, ESG, you are certified. 
You are A-OK. -okay. You're in the club. You say, well, I've never heard of that. That's the wildest thing I've ever heard. I have news for you. Over 80% of the conglomerates and the corporations of the world have this sign of approval stamped around their company and mount all of their money dealings. They are certified. They're in the club. Over 80% are part of $25 trillion worth of business around the world. You must have this. You say, well, that doesn't affect anybody. Someone in Spartanburg, South Carolina, only this week, has a little company. They take in about, handle about $100 million a year. He's a fine Christian man. He's saying, I don't know what I'm going to do. His little company has been selling and supplying goods to some big corporations, and the big corporations have come and says, are you certified? Or are you in the club? Are you meeting these standards of diversity, these standards that are put upon you? If not, we can't do business with you. So what is happening in the corporate world, they're trying to impose a whole new world agenda upon us, which is absolutely anti-family, anti-church, anti-God. That is where we are. And I just bumped into this slowly. Some of you have been there a long time. And I feel like I'm under that giant wave ready to crash down on me. And then I look at all of our bureaucracies. I look at how the media over and over again does not put priority on that which is really important. A few weeks ago, five prisoners broke out of a jail, a state prison, I guess it was, in Missouri. Five of them, they showed pictures of them getting out and how they escaped. And reports went out all over the place. Five jurors, and two of them, they said, were pedophiles. Whew, man, this was news everywhere. That same month, over 250,000 illegals came across our border, and we don't know who they are, where they're from, what they believe, and that wasn't even national news. How many pedophiles were in there? How many gang members were in there? How many murders were in there? Most countries, wisely so, have emptied their prisons and got them somehow to the southern border and they sent them all here in America. But the news was five escaped, not 250,000 came into our country, which we know nothing about with fentanyl, with sex trafficking, and you name it. But that wasn't particularly a big thing. While I'm getting in trouble, <laughs> and if you're in a pulpit today and you're not in trouble, you're not teaching God's word and moral truth in this world. <laughs> All these top secret documents you heard about that? Man, here you go. Now, former vice president, he found one somewhere. Trump had, I don't know how many. And then we have Biden, he has them in four or five locations. They find them over and over. You know what amazes me? You know what absolutely astounds me about all of that? Maybe you're not like I am. Nobody or very few are asking the questions about these top secret documents. They're not asking the right question. They're saying, well, is it legal? And they had been de declassified or, or, you know, who had them and when were they? You know, I guarantee you, anybody here could go and read these top secret, by the way, where in the world do the archives keep up with that? Who says where something is top secret or not? There is such a 
jumble of bureaucracy and ignorance and incompetence in federal government in the swamp, I can't even believe it. Now, do you know the question? The question is, tell us what's in these top secret things. This is what I want to know. Does that which Trump has, did he purposely take them out? Did they get swept up as he came out of the White House and came out of the Oval Office? But do they pertain to things that he does not want revealed or want to be seen or want the public to know about? Do they pertain to other scandals that he wanted to know? That would be a very easy thing to determine, ladies and gentlemen, right there up front. If there were motives that were personal and selfish and criminal, we need to know. And what about Biden's? What about his over there? Were they there to conceal the big business that's been going on between his family and countries all around the world? Was it there to cover up, to seal that? You could read them in a, an hour or less and see this is why he kept those. This is why Trump had those and poor Pence It's interesting though, nobody accused him of malfeasance. Have you noticed that? He just kept one in his Bible when he left the vice president's office. And when he discovered, he said, well, here it is, guys. But you see, he could never be elected president because he doesn't have charisma and he's way too Christian and way too moral. I understand that. But you see what I'm talking about? We're making things so complex, so overdone, so misreported, so mishandled. I feel like we just touch anywhere you go, whether it's education or whether it's you name it. I feel like that big wave is there just hovering over us and we're saying, oh God, our Lord, what am I to do? What are we to do? What are some answers here as to where we are at this moment in time? David was like this when he wrote this psalm. David was a man after God's own heart. He wrote 72 of these psalms. He was a harpist, a singer, a composer, a leader, a genius, any way you look at it, from a shepherd boy to taking care of Goliath, how he handled Saul when he was seeking to kill him for years, his whole manner in which he got to the kingdom. Sometimes sit down and read Second Chronicles chapter number one through chapter number 19. First of all, you'll be astounded at the culture, the polygamy, the immorality that went on. But in and through this, you have David trying to be a little remnant, hopefully for God, but in the process, when he should have been out fighting the war, he looked over the balcony and, and the window shade was up, right? Then the scandal with Bathsheba, then the cover-up and leading to her husband Uriah, being virtually murdered as he commanded he go to the front of the line to, in the attack that they, he would command. Then the long, long time in which he buried all this in his heart until Nathan went there and said, he didn't say, thou art the man, David, you're the one who sinned. He said with tears in his eye, he looked at his king and courageous said, David, you're the one who's in trouble with God. And that led to wonderful repentance, public and private. We'll deal with that psalm later on. David penned it. But then after all of this, we have to look and see what kind of father was David? With all the giftedness, what kind of father was David? Now, mind you, he was forgiven of his sin but when we are forgiven of our sin, it doesn't mean that 
we have sown and we have reaped and we're forgiven of that evil seed that we did sow, but that doesn't mean there's not consequences. I could get into a fight, which I started, and I was wrong in the fight, and in the fight, I would get an eye put out. I'd go to God, I'd ask those I fought to forgive me. I would clean up everything, but I still would live the rest of my life with one eye, right? Because of what I did. This is David. Nathan said, David, you're forgiven by God, but the sword will never leave your family. Nathan said, you're going to have problems with your kids from this day forward. And this is what we see here, exactly what was going on. Quickly, I'll tell you this story. Some of us know it. It's all built around Absalom. Absalom was perhaps the one who would logically have followed David as king. His mother was royalty. David was royalty. Absalom was handsome. He, he had hair, beautiful hair, a great physique, charisma, a leader of people. But we won't go there, but his hair got him in trouble. You know, three or four people have read that part of the Bible. <laughs> but Absalom got in trouble because he was the son of a father, David, who was passive. What happened? Long story made short. Amnon, son of David, raped his sister Tamar. Absalom thought his dad, the king, would do something about it. Said David was angry, but he didn't do anything. Time went on until Absalom himself killed his brother. Oh, not directly. He got somebody else to do it. Now, you ask the question, where did, where did Amnon, the one who killed, who raped his sister, get all the lust? It's in the family, isn't it? From his dad. Where in the world did Absalom get the idea he could kill his brother? Oh, not directly through somebody else. Through David. He took care of Uriah, not directly, but commanded it. You see how this passes through? And then when Absalom went into exile, he wanted to come home. David finally let him come home. But it went two years. David would not even look at his son, his wayward son, who was trying to come back. And when finally he looked into his face, he sort of pushed into one side. And Absalom began to start a revolution against his dad. A lot of bitterness happens in conflict, but there can be no deeper bitterness when your son or daughter revolts and vows to overthrow the dad and therefore the kingdom. You know what Absalom did? He did what a lot of people do. David made a lot of decision. He decided for one team, and Absalom would show up and say, you know, if I'd been king, I'd have decided for you. I, I wouldn't have gone the way Daddy did. And he did this all over the kingdom. And Absalom, when he went back, he rode in a chariot. He had soldiers walking along with him. He acted like a king. He performed like a king. And David, he did nothing. He did nothing with rape. He did nothing with murder with his kids. He did nothing when the egomaniac of Absalom began to explain itself until finally Absalom had gone all around to all the tribes and all of Israel, and now he had his army, his group, and they were ready. Most of the young people to throw away David, who still had, I'm sure in the eyes of the modern youth of that day, as is today, what's this God and, and synagogue all about anyway? What a way to rule a nation. If I were king, if I were king, if I were king. And now the revolution took place and David was stunned. He was in his house, made out of cedar, luxurious, larger than even the temple, which was yet to be, would be incidentally. It's an interesting. Solomon built it, but 
<laughs> the house of David and Solomon was bigger than the church that they built. What about that? The synagogue that they built. And so now the clarion call, Hebron, 25 miles of Jerusalem. Here's Absalom with now armies gathered from all over Israel. It was a coup d'etat. A coup d'etat is a sudden, violent overthrow of generally the king or the president or the prime minister. It's not a typical revolution. It can breed into a revolution, but get the king out and, hey, you've got him. So Absalom and all of his armies went after David, and David stunned, took his group, and fled, fled from his house went down from Jerusalem, down through the Kidron Valley, up over the Mount of Beatitudes, and he was running for his life. And the Bible said he was barefooted. I've walked that very path. I tell you, it's not a good place to go barefooted. And he covered his face. He was crying, broken, unbelief. He was, he was stunned. This king who was so active in his family he responded to a crisis by nothing, 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 and nothing. And here he is, finally, he looks around and some of his people are bringing, bringing along the Ark of the Covenant. Shekinah, the literal presence of God in their eyes. And, and that's what they did. When Israel went to battle, they'd bring the Ark, they'd take God out with them, right out in front. David, with great wisdom, in the middle of all of his family stupidity and complacency, he said, take the ark back up to Zion. Put it there in the synagogue where it belongs. It doesn't go with me. God may not be with us. I don't know. Put the ark back up there. And now here are thousands marshaled to kill the king, to destroy all of his followers, and everybody's turned against David. You read it there. Shimei was there, a family that was loyal to him. They was, he was cursing David, saying, you're a man of blood. Man, you don't have any chance. But Phibosheth, who was the son of Saul, that David had reinstated his table, he and his family all turned against him. Family, friends, soldiers, enemy people, those he'd honored, they all now turned on David, and David is running with a little bit of his family and, and his faithful men, and they go down and down and down for their life, and now they are bedded down, perhaps 48 hours later. David finally goes through a restless sleep, and then Joab, I think he was there. Oh, Joab's loyal. Commander-in-Chief, General of the Army, what a guy. Joab wakes up and looks over there at David, who'd gone to sleep under the stars. Maybe he hadn't done that since he was a shepherd or he was running from Saul. Or he'd gone to sleep under the stars, barefooted, crying, broken. He sees David picking up and writing something writing something, and David sort of smiled. Now they're surrounded by a thousand, thousands of people doing everything they can to kill him in David's life, and David's writing something. And let me show you what he has written. Look on the screen. Look on the screen. By the way, what the choir sang as their special is verbatim of every word in Psalm 3. So here's David, the whole wave of destruction over him, everything turned against him. He sits down and writes these words. I'm going to read the first verse and the dark areas if you'd read in a responsive way. I'll read first. Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many are they that rise up against me. But thou, O Lord, art a shield for me, my glory and the lifting up, lifter up of my head.
I laid me down and slept. I'll wait for the Lord sustain me. Arise, O Lord, and save me, my God. For thou hast smitten all mine enemies. Upon the cheekbone thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. Let me outline that for you. Verse 1 and verse 2 is a cry of hopelessness. Remember the situation. Verse 3 and verse 4 are a cry of faith. Verse 5 and verse 6 are a cry of confidence. Verse 7 and verse 8 is a battle cry. Let's look at it, exegete it, and see how relevant that is for you and for me if we're under any kind of wave in your family, in your business, in your health, in relationship with your children, in relationship with the world, in all the wokeism we're living under. Let's see if this gives us any answers. The first, Lord, how they are increased that trouble me. <laughs> Is that true where David was when he penned these words? Many they are be which, be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Selah, by the way, Selah, remember, it says something about music. It says probably there is a crescendo when this is sung there in the tabernacle. Also, it means, what do you think of that? Isn't that good? Here we are, bottoms fall out. He feels hopeless, helpless. And they say, David, you're such an immoral, rascal, adulterer, murderer, a crook, sorry leader. Let me tell you something. Even God is not interested in helping you. You have had it. Verse 1 and verse 2. Verse 3. But thou, O Lord, Wherever we are as a nation, wherever we are individually, wherever we are as a family, that's the whole thing. But thou, O oh Lord. You see the word Lord there. Yahweh or Jehovah. It means a covenant. It means that in all of this mistakes, the mountains and the valleys that David had experienced, he still had a relationship with God but thou, O oh Lord, I'm bottomed out. There's no hope. Even they say, God can't help me. Oh, but I know better. But thou, O oh Lord, a relationship with God in Jesus Christ, folks. You know how you can tell when somebody is really a Christian? It's when the bottom falls out of their life because of mistakes, because of sin, because of poor choices, if they just run and excuse and stay in the far country and go on and on and on and on and on, and they sort of tip God, but they don't get broken and come back in shame and repentance. If they do that, they know they still have a relationship with thou, O oh Lord. That's how you can tell. That's how you can tell. I've just read, I don't know if it's accurate or not, I can't imagine it, that 88% of the Senate and House of the United States are Christians. If that were microscopically true, wow, what a beautiful position we'd be in in America, would we not? But you see, somehow it's easy to have the name and go through the motions and not have thou, oh Lord. 
who run my, Lord, run my life. Thou, you're in charge. I make my life, my decision on basis of biblical truth. And David, even with the wave coming, thousands all around him, he's lost virtually everything. He says, thou, O Lord, he turns back home to God. Then the rest of it. Thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. And the word shield there in the Hebrew means a shield that went all the way around him. In other words, I've not only got your front, the Lord says, David knows I've also got your back. Man, he needed that because he'd been tricked and people had turned on him. You're a shield for me. My glory. You know what my glory is? That's David, David say his righteousness. Well, he didn't have a lot of righteousness. Oh, yes, he did. He'd repented. He'd got it right. He said, my righteousness, my glory, and the lifter of my head. You can look in a lot of directions when you're down, but if you lift up your head, that's toward God. And he said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill, Selah, what do you think about that? The ark was taken back on Zion. Now he looked up to God, and he looked beyond the ark all the way to heaven. And he said, God heard me. First two verses, hopeless. Three and four, words of faith. But thou, Lord. Do you have but thou, whatever's going on in your life? But thou, O Lord, but thou, O Lord, is that operative with you? Is it and when, when we're just bottomed out, there's no light, and we seem confused? Listen, you keep all your eyes on that which is wrong, that which is broken. All you have to do is look up to God, and you see he's still running this world, and he wants to run your life and my life 24-7. But... Thou, O oh Lord. And then look at five and six. Here we have confidence. It's a cry of confidence. I laid me down and slept. I awakened. The Lord sustained me. Can you imagine? There are five or six or seven or 10,000 people, two hills away, waiting to come and kill you and eliminate everything you have in your life. And you went down and took a Took a nap, you slept all night long. That's called trust, isn't it? Boy, I've had to rely on that many times. When I forget, I have to go back to it. I laid me down and slept. I wakened. The Lord sustained me because of thou, O Lord. He said, I will not be afraid of 10,000 people who have set themselves against me round about. The shield covered him round about all around him to those who would take his life. But thou, O Lord, are a shield for me. And he lay down and slept, and the Lord sustained him. Whew. And then we read a battle cry. Arise, O Lord. Do you see the battle is here, the shield? Uh, we're going to see the brokenness here. Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies with the cheekbone, and thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. In other words, he knew that the victory belonged to God, not from him. He had bottomed out. He'd been the nothing, nothing man with his family, and now he is going to be something with this family of God. And he said, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. And then he turned away from himself he said, thy blessings is upon thy people. Not just those who are still pro-David, but also those who are pro-Absalom. What a psalm for you and for me, for our nation, for this time. And we are in a battle, ladies and gentlemen, for the heart and soul and minds of our nation and of our families. The number one problem in America today is passive fathers, AWOL fathers, look at it throughout history. Almost every major crisis we face, 
would beginning to be healed and solved if we would have dads, fathers, who'd be godly men and would not be passive, passive when challenges and crisis come to the family. How far is this passivity gone? I'll give you a little vignette that happened just a couple of weeks ago. I'll not tell you the school and I'll tell you any names, but not far from here, in middle school, there was a kid in middle school who was an absolute jerk. He was a bully. He led a little crowd of rich bullies in this school. He challenged teachers. He ran roughshod over kids. He was always in trouble, always in the principal's office. Dad was always called up there. His mom was always called up there. Totally wild, totally a jerk, totally undisciplined. Until a couple of weeks ago, he did something tragic, tragic thing. Anyway, the principal called him in. And this kid, middle school, pulled out his cell phone and on speed dial, he had a lawyer that his daddy had provided for him so he would not have to come up there again. So he mashed speed dial in front of the principal and the lawyer said, don't say anything. That's a little snapshot of passive fathers in the 21st century. You know the story, David's army, the people rallied around him. They defeated Absalom's revolution, his coup d'etat. Absalom was fleeing and he caught his long hair on the branches. I guess he had one of those super cuts like we see now. I don't know. He caught his hair and he was dangling there and David had told everybody, don't kill my boy, save Absalom. I wanna, don't, don't kill him. But when Joab saw him there, he went over and they killed Absalom. When the news went back to David, David was back in Jerusalem. Everything had been reestablished. They told David he went into mourning. And the classic words, he said, oh, my son, my son, my son, Absalom. Oh, my son, Absalom, would to God I had died for thee in your place. Oh, my son, Absalom. And he was broken and empty and defeated. The secret sins of a father and mother, or a father, tragically or so many times become shameful sins in their sons and in their daughters. Nothing can take the place in a child's life but a Dad, but a dad. Dad, make sure in your life right now you have a vow, oh Lord.